everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com back again for another exciting look at AEW Dynamite. But how good was AEW Dynamite last night? There's only one way to find out, and that is by assigning each individual segment a lovely individual grade. Lots of stuff to talk about. We had an NWA women's title match. We had a brand new tag team debuting on Dynamite. We, of course, had the Inner Circle going to Vegas. We had Cody and Darby versus Team Taz. All that stuff to talk about. So without any further ado, let's kick it off. This is AEW Dynamite graded. And we start off Dynamite hot and fresh and full of action because it's the bloody Young Bucks taking on the hot new tag team on the block, Darius and Dante Martin, AKA Top Flight. Oh, that's not a good start, Jack, come on. There's a little video package introducing the two and talking about how they, they sent a message to Matt Jackson asking him to watch their highlight reel and he got back to them and it all led to bigger and better things. It's very good stuff. The part that I found disgusting was when they mentioned that they are 21 and 19 years old. Oh. They say, we grew up watching tag teams like the Young Bucks, like the Motor City Machine Guns, and I'm like, wow, I thought they were gonna say, normally young tag teams say like the Hardys and the Dudleys and Edge and Christian, but I guess that's not young anymore. <laughs> so they're saying, oh, we love the Young Bucks, we love the Motor City Machine Guns. I'm expecting them to keep going and say, yeah, we grew up on the Usos, we grew up on the Street Profits, Strowman and Nicholas, those sort of classic vintage tag teams. And to be fair to them, Top Flight start off really well. They're getting all their moves in, they're, they're beating up the Young Bucks, basically, proving that they are the better tag team. Just give them the belts already, there's no need to have the match. The Bucks obviously fight back, they're being sort of heelish in a way because they're facing pure baby faces, so they're being really cocky and stuff without being outright heels. They go for the melter driver, but Top Flight managed to slip out of it, turn the tables, throw their opponents to the outside, and hit a pair of big boy dives over the top rope. They even at one stage, now we've seen plenty of teams reverse the melter driver, teams like Private Party and FTR, but I don't recall seeing a tag team reverse more bang for your buck, which Top Flight do, into a little roll up, a little surprise one for a near fall. So the Bucks decide, right, well, it's probably time to end it now. BTE trigger in the middle of the ring, one, two, three, and after a very valiant effort, Top Flight lose their Dynamite debut. But it's not over yet because after the bell, Angelico and Jack Evans, those horrible men, jump Top Flight and beat them up a little bit and the Bucks chase them away, uh, thereby setting up, I guess, the first real feud for Top Flight against Angelico and Jack Evans. And, and that's the segment. All oh, the Bucks hold up, you know, Top Flight's hands very graciously as well and go, these guys are the best, yeah. Well, you know, you shouldn't have beat them then. No, I'm joking. They've just won the tag belts, come on. A minus grade for this match, high energy, fast paced, high flying opening, good match, really impressive stuff from the Top Flight boys, and I'm excited to see what they do next. Now we head backstage to a short video package promo type thing with John Moxley, who talks about his dad and how he made him who he is today. He said his dad was a big scary dude, uh, if you got in trouble, you'd be terrified of him. But one day his dad came to pick up Moxley from, from jail. He got locked up for the night. And uh, his dad picked him up and, and basically told him, look, when, we're the good guys. We're not the bad guys. We're the good guys. And Moxley carried that motto with him through life. And even when things get really hard, he still keeps that inside. So he's talking about how he's going to beat Kenny Omega or how he's going to face him at the contract signing tonight, first and foremost. And he says, you know what? I'm not. It's a really stressful time. I can't get out of bed in the morning. My body's in pain. I've got a pregnant wife at home. I hold two different different titles on two different continents. It's all gay on top of me quite a lot, but I just remember what my dad always used to say, we're the good guys. No great for this one, just a characteristically good promo from John Moxley, even if it was a little bit on the short side. Pregnant wife at home? Does Renee know about her? Next up, we have Orange Cassidy taking on Kip Sabian in singles action. Amiro is on commentary and refers to his own tag team partner and best friend as Kip Sabian. That's okay, man, Miro. I'm a fan of the machine guns as well, to be fair. At one stage, Cassidy's looking to build up a bit of a head of steam, but a brief little distraction by Penelope Ford on the outside allows Sabian to turn the tables and get back into the match. At one stage, Sabian goes to like kick off the ropes into some kind of DDT or swinging manoeuvre like that and just sort of slips and it's a bit, ooh, but Cassidy manages to catch him. And in fairness, even though it was a botch, they do really well saving the match and moving on pretty seamlessly. I mean, straight after this, Sabian gets a near fall off a big penalty kick and, you know, it's almost like nothing ever happened. They did a really good job here of 
kind of masking that mistake. Kip goes for a swinging neck breaker, like a draping swinging neck breaker with Cassidy's feet on the top rope. But Orange rolls out, gets a little roll up, one, two, it's no good. So Sabian just goes for the move again a little bit later on. And this time when Cassidy slips out, he turns it into that mouse trap, that especially devious pinning predicament. And that's enough for three. Miro is not happy on commentary and <laughs> I have rarely seen, not since, not since Rampage in WCPW, have I seen a wrestler make a run in with such aggression and terror terrifyingness like he runs down from the commentary booth and just gets in the ring and just levels Orange Cassidy with a lariat and he didn't stop sprinting from the moment he left the commentary table to the time he got in the ring and nailed that lariat it was hilarious and scary the best friends come down and chase Miro and Sabian away and hug Orange Cassidy but he can barely stand because he's been decked by Miro and um it gets a B grade from me good match a little bit of a botch but they, they played it off okay and um nothing really to complain about next up it's time for the contract signing for the AD World Championship match uh, at Winter is Coming on December 2nd. Hopefully it ends better than Game of Thrones actually did. Kenny Omega makes his big elaborate entrance. He gets in the ring. He's all suited up. He's got the shades on like when he was the cleaner back in New Japan. And um, we get Moxley's entrance music, but no Moxley entrance. He's not there. We're backstage and Moxley has been jumped. He's lying on the floor. His nose is a bloody mess. He's been attacked, you guys. It's terrifying times. We are back to the ring and Shivani is like, well, Kenny, do you have anything to say about this? And Omega insinuates that Moxley is faking it to get out of the match with him. Oh, you naughty, naughty boy. Omega signs the contract and that's it, and just leaves. So it's a bit of an underwhelming contract signing really, but I'm sure it's gonna lead to something down the line. So it gets a B minus grade, um, but I still think that it was interesting. You can't, it's hard to grade because it wasn't much of a segment itself. Nothing really happened in terms of action. We just saw Moxley after the attack and Omega obviously was the only one to sign the contract. But I think it's going to lead to something further down the line. It's a B- minus for now, but I'm still quite hopeful. Next up, it's the Inner Circle heading to Las Vegas. Now, I've just, I've got my notes here because there was just a whole list of stuff that they did and little skits and jokes that were crammed in there. Uh, before I talk about whether I enjoyed it or not, I will point out that this was really nicely produced, really well made, really well shot and everything. So that is a positive, certainly. I just think the bit that let it down for me slightly was the content itself. So we've got various different things. I'll just list them off. MJF screwing Sammy over at the blackjack table, switching cards with him. Oh, uh, they go to a weird kind of deserted slash socially distanced strip club, which is odd. Um, MJF and Jericho challenge each other. They're doing harder and harder shots of alcohol. Um, so they're like, well, how about a shot of vodka? Well, how about rum? Well, how about this, that, that, blah, blah, blah. They end up getting just like 100% pure alcohol and regretting it immensely, obviously. A little bit later on, Santana and Ortiz, uh, oh, right, they're like, do you want to take this to the next level? And they bring along, they open this limo and out gets Conan, because they were all together in LAX, remember? But it was just weird to see Conan. It was pretty cool to see him, to be fair. He's like, I've got the good stuff, get in. They all get in the limo, they get out later on, they're all high as bloody kites. Jericho is obviously just stoned off his face, um, and then they stumble across a man in a dragon costume who I've seen people react to on Twitter as someone from the UK actually called Piff the Magic Dragon. I don't know if he's a magician or a comedian or what, but he's there, Jericho thinks he's a real dragon because he's been blazing the wacky tabacky. But it's not, is it? It's a man. It's a man in a dragon costume. Dragons aren't even real. Couple of things here, right? So when Santana and Ortiz are like, do you want to take things to the next level? We've got the good stuff. Do you want to get crazy? Um, I don't know anyone who's who's used marijuana to take things to the next level. It's usually to take things to, the, to like a much lower level. And secondly, I know Jericho thinks he's hallucinating, thinks he's seeing things. Oh, it's the dragon. But you don't hallucinate when you're high on weed. So I've heard anyway, so my sources tell me. More stuff, uh, Wardlow and Jake Hager take out their silent, seething anger towards each other by just beating up several bar employees and somehow they don't get immediately arrested for that. Later on, the Inner Circle are all on a rooftop. They've got an Elvis impersonator with them who they just keep calling Elvis because he does a decent impression of Elvis. I mean, who doesn't? Uh -huh. uh, MJ, hmm. weak, weak Jack, weak. MJF then gives uh, Zach Galifianakis' speech from The Hangover, talks about how he's running with a wolf pack now. Sammy tries to make a blood oath with a real knife. They're all like, whoa, Sammy, no, chill. And then they all get drunk and howl at the moon. And then they wake up the next day and obviously can't remember anything because it's, because again, it's, it's the hangover plot. And when they all wake up in various different rooms and different states of disrepair, apart from Ortiz, who's just furiously working out and just is showing no ill effects from the night before, uh, MJF 
comes across Sammy and argues with him and the camera pans around and reveals that Sammy has scrawled all over MJF's face like soft and Sammy was here and hilarious things like that. Also Sammy realizes he's got a wedding ring on and he got married three times last night, whoa. And then Jericho hears some crying and he's like, what's that? And I'm like, here we go, the big payoff of this long and mixed segment, I suppose. And then Jericho opens the door to find the source of the crying and it's Swoggle in a diaper. And that's it. This gets a C grade from me. There were some decent ideas in here and I enjoyed the cameos from Conan and Swoggle, but the real drawback for me was the lack of anything of substance. There was no real progression here in terms of storyline, I don't think. So I can't give it higher than a C really. It was well made and it was well acted for the most part. And there were a couple of funny jokes, but really it was hard to shake the feeling like it was just a little bit of a waste of time. Next up, we have Pac's first match back since his return. It's Pac versus The Blade. The Butcher and the Bunny are at ringside, of course. Eddie Kingston's on commentary. And I'm expecting, honestly, Pac to just run through The Blade in a couple of minutes. But that's really not what happens. The story of the match is that every time Pac starts to string a few moves together, he either deliberately distracts himself by sliding out of the ring to confront The Butcher, or gets jumped by The Butcher or, or distracted by The Bunny when the referee's back is turned, when The Blade is getting the referee's attention in the ring. And it becomes quite a frustrating watch, actually. This goes on for a really long time, actually. And even though Pac and The Blade are both excellent workers, I just feel like the match never really got to pick up any sort of steam because of it. At one stage, Pac looks like he's got The Blade in position for the Black Arrow, but the bunny gets on the apron, distracts the ref, the butcher jumps in the ring, Pac nails him with a thrust kick, turns around, and The Blade rolls him up with a handful of tights but Pac manages to kick out a two. Decent false finish there, in all fairness. A few moments later, Pac hits the shooting star press to the back of the blade because he's lying face down. Uh, Pac transitions straight away into the brutalizer. The blade taps out, and that's your match. Pac gets on the mic and looks to call out Eddie Kingston on commentary, and he's like, Whoa there, buddy lad! But then the butcher just decks him from behind straight away, and Kingston's down in the ring, and the heels will do a very heelish beat down. Phoenix runs down to make the save. He looks to springboard into the ring to help Pac and just misses and lands on Pac. Not deliberate as well, quite comical sadly, in an unintentional sort of way. But Phoenix gets up, he's throwing blows, he's trying his best, the numbers game is too much, they beat him down. And here comes Penta with a steel chair. And they try and make it seem like Penta's gonna side with the heels, but I think it's fairly predictable what happens here. So Penta's got the chair, Kingston's like, yes, join in, hit your brother, hit him with the chair. And Penta goes, okay, and swings at Kingston instead. Kingston sees this, rolls out the ring before he can get hit, all the heels bail, and Death Triangle, are reunited back in the ring. We skate to one song and one song only. I just realized that they, they put diamonds up, don't they, Jay-Z and Kanye, when they do that? I'll do better next time. This gets a B- minus grade from me, unfortunately. Um, I just thought the booking was all off in the match. Even though the match was fine, I feel like it would have been better if Pac had just ran through the blade, not instantly, but like, not, not as long as it went, obviously. And the blade controlled much of the match as well, which isn't really what we want to see when it comes to Pac. The post-match saved it though from a lower grade because I'm excited to see Death Triangle back and I'm excited for some Pac, Penta and Phoenix six-man goodness. So, you know, it's not all bad. We head backstage again where someone else has been attacked. This time it's Brandy Rhodes and Jade Cargill is there and pilmanizes Brandy's arm inside a steel chair, stomping on the chair and injuring Brandy in the process. Uh, Big Swole comes along and kind of gets in Cargill's face and Cargill backs off, but she's already done the damage. And it looks like she's aligned because in the background, it looks like she's aligned with Nyla Rose and Vicky Guerrero. No sign of Shaquille O'Neal yet, but you know, I'm still holding out hope. Next up we have, oh, in my mind, I think the best match of the night, the NWA Women's World Title match between Serena Deeb and the woman she took the belt from, Thunder Rosa. This match is excellent. Both of them have a really good chemistry and both are just great anyway. So together they put on a really good match. Um, it starts off slow and technical and intense and methodical, and then it progresses to bigger and bigger moves, building steadily. A style that both women are really good at anyway, so together, it's really good. There's so many counters and everything. Some unique spots as well. Deep hits a big spear along the apron and falls to the outside, and Thunder Rosa has to take the bump on the apron. That's really cool. Thunder Rosa at one point with a huge missile drop kick, knocking Serena Deeb all the way to the outside of the ring as well. But this is where the match takes a bit of a turning point. That's because Reba, or Rebel, or Reba, uh, jumps the barricade and distracts the referee. And while she's doing so, in the ring, Britt Baker's there, she drags Thunder Rosa to the ramp and hits a swinging or rolling neckbreaker and Thunder Rosa's down and out and Britt Baker's attacked her. We don't know why yet, 
but I'm guessing we'll find out in the near future. Serena Deeb doesn't see any of this. Uh, she tries to pin Thunder Rosa anyway. Thunder Rosa kicks out. We go into an exchange of roll-up attempts, like back and forth, until Deeb transitions so smoothly into kind of an Anaconda Vice type chokehold, but with the legs around the head as well. It's quite unique. It looks really cool. But then Thunder Rosa gets out of that and just nails like a little thin ball of foot stomp to the midsection of Deeb. More very, very smooth exchanges here until finally Serena Deeb hits that move. I don't know the name of it. I really should learn it. It's kind of like the Styles Clash, but without the uh, legs around the arms. It's more just like an arm trapped Styles Clash kind of thing. Um, it's a face buster, effectively. And it gets the win for Serena Deeb but not in clean fashion exactly. Deeb leaves, she's got the bell, she's fine, she's happy, she doesn't really know anything's gone on behind her back. Thunder Rosa is devastated. She heads to the outside of the ring slowly and then snaps and jumps Britt Baker on the barricade, drags her over, they start brawling and brawling and brawling. The refs have to pull them apart and that ends the segment. Peace up, A-Town down. This gets an A grade from me. Uh, verging on an A+, plus, but it had that little interference as well, which I'm sure will lead two good things down the line for Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa as well. But at the moment, yes, it was a great match. Uh, the interference took a little bit away from it, but I can't complain too much. Easy A grade, best match of the night. Now we go backstage to two members of the Dark Order, John Silver and Anna Jay. And John Silver cuts such an 80s promo. He just shouts everything. He's like, Anna Jay, your career was transformed by the Dark Order. You used to be a loser, but you've won your last five matches. And Anna Jay's just there trying not to laugh. She does a really good job. I would have laughed by this point. She's just there like, yeah, that's right, I have. And then John Silver's like, that's why Mr. Brody has asked Tony Khan. He does that when he says Tony Khan for some reason, as if he's not a real person, to give you a title shot next week against Hikaru Shida. And that's it. And then the match is confirmed. No grade. Love John Silver. More promo time for him, please. So that match is going to take place next week, Anna Jay versus Akara Shida. But for now, we have uh, the main event of the night, the TNT champion Darby Allen teaming with the man he beat for the title, Cody Rhodes, to take on Team Taz, Brian Cage and Ricky Starks, with Taz himself on commentary. And one thing that I found funny was that Cody, with his three entrances, comes out and all like, Adrenaline in my soul, oh my name is Cody Rhodes. And he comes out and he's all like, yeah, I'm Cody Rhodes. Your wife's had her arm broken backstage. Anyway. <laughs> Cody's fine, uh, Darby's in the match as well, they start off really well, they are controlling the heels for the opening moments of this match. So Taz leaves his commentary position and just heads straight down to ringside to coach his boys. And Taz makes his impact immediately felt. He grabs Cody's leg through the ropes at one point and on the other side of the ring, Arn Anderson loses his mind and throws a steel chair in the ring out of anger and the referee says, you are out of here, Enforcer. Get to the back and enforce somewhere else. At one stage, Darby has a rear waist lock on Ricky Starks and Brian Cage jumps in and thinks, I'm not having this. And just German suplexes both Darby and his own partner as well, just for a laugh. It does turn the tide of the match, but Cody turns it back a little while later, nailing the crossroads on Ricky Starks, but he's not the legal man. Brian Cage is in control instead. He deals with Cody. Cody's on the outside of the ring. Darby is isolated, but Darby builds up a head of steam. He heads to the top rope. It looks like he's gonna maybe beat Cage. Ricky Starks grabs his leg, holds him on the top rope, and Cage has it. Up on the turnbuckles, Cage hits an avalanche drill claw on Darby Allen. Oh. It looks nasty and destructive in the best way. Uh, and that's enough for Brian Cage to pin the new TNT champion on TNT, the indignity. The heels do a beat down after the match. They're beating up the faces, but here comes Will Hobbs to chase them off with a steel chair. Lay it again, Will Hobbs, mate. Lay it again to one of these. The damage has already kind of been done. But Hobbs is in the ring. He's looking jacked, brother, and he's ready to kick some ass. And he notices that Brian Cage has left his FTW championship in the ring. He holds the belt up and everyone's like, oh, this is going to lead to Cage versus Hobbs. And then Will Hobbs turns and levels Cody Rhodes with the title belt. And that's the end of the show with Will Hobbs having joined Team Taz and things look bad for Cody and Darby, you guys. This gets an A- minus grade for me. I was going to give the match a B plus because it was really enjoyable, but I'm bumping it to an A- minus because that shocking heel turn right at the end. I think it's good. I think it gives Will Hobbs a bit of a character to work with, a bit of a storyline to get his teeth into. I disagree maybe a little bit with Darby taking a pinfall so soon into his title reign, but it took a huge move to do it from Brian Cage, and I can't complain too much if it's going to further the storyline and lead to good things a little bit later on. So that is it for the show. Now, what do I give it overall? Uh, at first, I thought I was going to give this show like a B, maybe even a little bit less. Instead, I've bumped it way up there to an A-, because really, that Thunder Rosa and Serena D match was awesome, 
And I really enjoyed the main event segment too. They really carried the show along with that opening tag match between the Bucks and Top Flight. And because there were three really strong segments and really key segments in the show, I think I have to give it an A minus. Things that threatened to drag it down a little bit. The Inner Circle Las Vegas trip wasn't the best really. The contract signing wasn't the most eventful, but I think it's probably going to go somewhere in the future. So it was a very up and down episode of AEW Dynamite, but I think a strong one when you look at those three segments. They were really, really good stuff. So that's my opinion, but what do you think? Let me know in that comment section down below. And thank you very much for watching. I've been Jack from Cardaholic.com. Stay safe out there, of course. Stay positive, and I'll see you very soon.